Donal McIntyre, investigative journalist best known for his fearless work confronting dangerous criminal organisations, is on a mission to uncover the modern face of international crime. Travelling with him to some of the world's best known cities, we'll meet members of the criminal underworld, police and local residents to discover what life is really like in the world's toughest towns. We're in Mexico City, where organised crime has been responsible for more carnage than many wars. Rocket propelled grenades, AK-47s, bazookas. The government has lost control here. This is a city where no one is safe on the streets. Where ruthless kidnapping gangs are terrorising the population. You prepare in a way to be killed. Mexico City, the capital of Mexico, has a population of 20 million people and is one of the largest cities in the world. It's famed for its cuisine and rich culture. But look beyond the mariachis and margaritas and you discover that Mexico City is an extremely volatile place. <laughs> the gap between rich and poor has grown rapidly in recent years, leading to a phenomenal rise in violent crime, making Mexico City one of the most dangerous places on the planet. Donald's here to find out how a combination of poverty and corruption has led to a crime and murder epidemic that last year claimed the lives of more than five and a half thousand people. Here in Mexico City, it seems that violence and death are on public display. Just a glance at a newspaper stall leaves you no doubt about the scale of violent crime in the city. Look at this, this is the um, back page of uh, one of the main papers here, La Prensa. Um, police, gangsters, dead bodies. Look, strewn all over the place. Unbelievable. These graphic pictures are fed to the papers by photographers who go in search of the most gruesome crime scenes. A British contact of Donald's has arranged for him to go out on a nighttime photo shoot with Mexico City's violent crime paparazzi. This is Monumental, we're here, and uh, all these guys are um, crime reporters with various different newspapers, radio stations, these guys as well. And uh, they basically just hang out here and, and uh, wait for any information to come in. Maybe they're scanning the radio so they're getting information that way. And uh, just see if there's a murder or an accident, and then from here they, they leg it off to, to wherever the accident is and go and cover the news. So why is it uh, dangerous? Um, it's dangerous because you never know if, if something's gone down, like a shootout outside of a bar or something, you never know if it's still happening or if more trouble kicks off when the police gets there. So they have come across like, you know, bullets flying and, or they, they've, they've had their cameras ripped away or they've been shoved around, beaten up. There is a risk, you know, anything can happen at night. John has introduced Donald to one of the most experienced crime reporters in the city. Why are the images which you uh, take of dead bodies and riddled bodies um, so popular with the public? Mm. 
la gente de aquí compra los periódicos y cuando llega la nota roja, lo policíaco, ya se queda ahí y empieza a ver más, este, empieza a ver las fotos, ¿no? las imágenes que... Dono is beginning to suspect that violence and death are an accepted part of the culture here. It seems that everywhere you look, there's a police car. Everywhere. Cruising the streets. But as yet, no action from the boys. Some nights they say that they're going backwards, to and fro, 100 miles an hour, all across the city. But for the moment it's quiet. But it surely can't be quiet for too long. Soon enough, the photographers intercept a call about a murder across town. The press team speed through the streets, running red lights and screeching around corners in a macabre race to be the first to arrive at the scene of the crime. They arrive at the scene at the same time as the first police officers. And sure enough, there is a dead body lying in the street. The police make half-hearted attempts to keep the photographers at bay. And the arrival of the ambulance seems of secondary importance to capturing the images that will sell to the newspapers. It's becoming clear that in Mexico City, murder is big business and people seem to have become desensitized to it. Well, this is the guy's uh, staple diet, dead bodies, mayhem. They believe that it was a uh, gunshot, um, the back of the head. We allowed ridiculously close to the scene of the shooting. Finally, the police cordon off the area and start gathering evidence. We may be stepping on the casing, and that's how uh, quick the reporters, the crime reporters, have got to the scene. We're now being asked to lift up our feet because the bullet casing that um, took that man's life is just here. And that was found by the photographer. It seems that the photographers have got what they need and the scene starts to wind down. This is a very common scene for you, David. This is a normal life. Sí, sí, aquí en la Ciudad de México, sí. Es muy común. Y es, y es de todos los días. Um, do you ever worry that you might end up on the front page as a dead body of a new, in a newspaper yourself? Que te pasa alguna vez por la mente, ¿no? Te pasa alguna vez en la me por la mente que vayas a ser tú el que te vayan a tomar la foto. ¿no? Es como una, digamos que una regla de oro, ¿no? Entre, digamos, entre nosotros. Si, por ejemplo, algún compañero de nosotros llegara a caer, eh, no tomaríamos foto de él. Te, por respeto al compañero no lo harías. We came here with Donal knowing Mexico City was dangerous, but we weren't expecting to see this level of violence so soon after arriving. This place is definitely not for the faint-hearted. Coming up. Donal finds out that the drug gangs are taking violence on the streets of Mexico City to unprecedented levels. More than 500 police and soldiers have been murdered this year by drug gangs and discovers why it's not just Mexicans, but visiting Europeans who are being targeted by criminals. This girl that I know that was taken away was beaten up, just dumped. We're in Mexico City with Donald McIntyre, and already we've seen that life is cheap and murder on the streets is an everyday occurrence. but this is a city of colour and contrast, where visitors are made to feel welcome and people know how to throw a party. <laughs> 
Even death here is a cause for celebration. Mexico is famous for its Day of the Dead festival, held every November on the Catholic holy days of All Saints Day and All Souls Day. Millions of people pay tribute to the dead at a ceremony which dates back thousands of years to the Aztec Indians. Perhaps this uniquely Mexican fascination with death is one of the reasons why murder and violence have always been out in the open in Mexico City. Riots, revolutions and violence seem to be in the Mexican DNA. In 1968, thousands of students protesting against the government were massacred by soldiers and police who opened fire on the unarmed civilians. The severe economic recession in the 1990s led to a massive increase in crime that saw Mexico City explode in lawlessness. Donald's meeting up with crime journalist Joan Grillo to find out more about the situation on the ground. Just give us a flavour of Mexico City and crime. Crime here really exploded in the 1990s. You've got a lot of forms of robbery or extortion, ways of getting money, carjacking, kidnapping for ransom. These kind of crimes are very common in Mexico City. The criminal organisations realise they can get away with it. Crime pays. In many cases, there's been many proven cases where police are working with organised crime. This climate of corruption has given Latin America's most ruthless drug gangs freedom to ply their murderous trade on the streets of this city. There's 4,000 drug-related murders in one year in Mexico. They want to send a message out. They want to show their rivals that we're going to kill you, often in very terrifying ways. Sometimes they'll kill the people, kill everyone around them as well. Sometimes they'll chop their heads off and put their heads with a note. Sometimes they'll kill them on video and put the video on the internet. Uh, so they kill them in a way to try and terrorise their enemies as well. But they also want to speak to the population, to the people. They want to speak to the street. And they want to tell the street, we're the guys running this show. You don't go to the police to talk about us, you give us information. They want to show they can kill any time, any place and get away with it. Yuan has taken Donald to a place in the heart of the city where a recent incident highlighted how the drug cartels seem free to kill anyone that opposes them. Well, it was rush hour in November, no, November, and a Learjet plane came crashing right down onto the street. Exploded in flames, killed everyone on board and killed several people driving that day. Uh, and people walked on the street. And on board that plane was the number two in the government. He's the interior secretary. And also on board was a, a federal prosecutor called Jose Luis Santiago Vasconcelos, who was a very dedicated anti-crime fighter. Although the plane crash was officially recorded as an accident, both of the high-ranking politicians on board were dedicated opponents of the cartels. So, so explain the trajectory of the plane. Obviously, traffic you know, was immediately thrown all over the place. People were, you know, were burnt up came down a ball of flames and then it carried on pushing through here with engines, wings thrown all over the place till it started throwing stuff to this building here and you can see from the building here where it's all boarded up now uh, where parts of the aircraft were thrown onto it. It's incredible that a disaster of this scale could have been engineered by drug cartels, especially when it involved killing politicians in the public eye. Surely the gangsters here aren't powerful enough to take out a vice president. Right now in the climate Mexico is in, there's been attacks on hundreds of police and soldiers this year. More than 500 police and soldiers across Mexico have been murdered this year by drug gangs. One guy, the head of the federal police, was shot dead by drug gangs in his own house. He went home, opened the door, there was a guy there with a gun, shot him dead in his house. In that kind of climate, Something like this happens and everybody immediately thought, you know, this is drug gangs or some kind of killing. That's the first thought that came to most Mexicans' head. Who's running Mexico? You know, it seems in a state of flux, a state of absolute chaos and violence. We're talking about armed groups, you know, organised crime, drug cartels, with thousands of men at arms using rocket-propelled grenades, AK-47s, 
AR-15s, bazookas. I mean, these guys have done more carnage than a lot of guerrilla uprisings. This is more violence than a lot of war. So you get a real sense of the government has lost control here. Donald is shocked to learn that the drug cartels have such a stranglehold over Mexico that the country appears to be sliding into total lawlessness. Mexico is the main supply route for cocaine and other drugs entering the United States. It's a huge business, which may go some way to explaining why the cartels are willing to go to such lengths to protect their business interests. As the cartels have grown in strength and influence, Mexico City has also witnessed the emergence of another criminal phenomenon. Kidnapping. <laughs> Kidnapping in Mexico City has now reached epidemic proportions. In 2007 alone, there were 1,028 kidnapping reports in Mexico. That's almost three a day. 65 of those victims were killed. Kidnappings in Mexico are organised crime operations, motivated purely by money. Experts point to a link between the rise in kidnappings and the increasing gap that separates the rich and the poor. In a society like this, it is necessary for those with money to invest heavily to protect themselves from criminals. Donal is on his way to meet a man who's made a business out of providing rich people with security on the main streets of Mexico City. Francisco Ramirez is the head of an organization called CIOS. Grupo CIO significa Centro de Información y Operaciones en Seguridad. This company is one of the largest private security firms in Mexico City. Desafortunadamente, eh, por la situación que se vive en el país, el secuestro es una realidad. El secuestro hoy en día está incrementando. De... O sea, se ha incrementado la la parte agresiva, la parte bárbara del secuestro. Ya en una época se tomó una modalidad que, que sale de México, que son las mutilaciones. Eh, bandas especializadas formadas y entrenadas por el narcotráfico, su modo de vida es la ilegalidad, están entrenados para aspectos violentos y están girando a secuestrar. El hecho de que sean delincuentes eh, novatos en el tema del secuestro eh, genera el riesgo tan alto para la víctima. El dormitorio. Muchos más tristes y más lamentables personas de la autoridad dedicadas a grupos de antisecuestro que terminaban siendo personas dedicadas al secuestro, que no es secreto, o sea, está en todos los medios de comunicación. It's no surprise that these sorts of organizations do well, when people in Mexico City simply can't trust the police. In this climate, the kidnapping problem can only get worse. Donald's going to meet a young man who went through the horror of a kidnap ordeal and lived to tell the tale. Rodrigo Alvarez was approached by two men and seized at gunpoint whilst visiting a friend in this middle-class neighborhood. I remember I, I raised my hands. They told me, don't raise your hands, don't raise your hands. At that point, the kidnappers bundled Rodrigo into a car and drove off. And they started asking me things like, uh, how much do you think your family could pay for your life? Well, that, that's a question that I didn't know how to answer. Maybe they could pay you a... 100,000 pesos. And, and he told me, OK, we're, we'll, we would ask for 200,000. Rodrigo was taken to a house in an unknown location. The kidnappers were going to ask for a ransom sum equivalent to 15,000 euros. He feared the worst. They told me, OK, calm down. Just don't, don't do stupid things. Don't try to escape. Don't try to run away. And you're going to be all right. They gave me food but I didn't want to eat because my stomach at that point was shattered. It's a funny feeling because you kind of 
prepare in a way to be killed. Because you know that they can do it uh, any time. Rodrigo's parents negotiated his release and paid the ransom. When they told me that, that uh, the ransom had been paid, well, I, I was glad. They told me, this is what you're going to do. We're going to take you in the car. We're going to leave you in some place. You're going to walk uh, 100 uh, steps. And you're going you know, to have to look back. Because if you look back, we're going to shoot you. Despite their terrifying ordeal, Rodrigo and his family decided not to contact the authorities. We never wanted to go to police, you know, because I was free. You don't know if, the, if it's true that the police is ganged up with these guys. If they are connected in some way. We, we talked about it and we said we're not going to the police because well, you don't know if they're going to take revenge on us. Coming up, Donal experiences a long arm of the law, Mexican style. <laughs> and meets a man who took the law into his own hands after his daughter was brutally murdered. She was shot with a 45 caliber gun in the neck. We're with Donald McIntyre in Mexico City, the kidnapping capital of the world, and we're getting a taste for how organized crime is terrorizing the streets. Donald's shocked by what he's seen. It seems like a city spiralling out of control. Kidnapping is a big problem here, but an even bigger problem is the widespread corruption amongst the police that sees many crimes go unpunished. Donald's heard that the Mexican government has promised to tackle this issue, so he's on his way to meet the newly formed anti-kidnapping unit. These specially chosen cops are said to be incorruptible. If that's true, then they are in a minority amongst the Mexican police force. As he arrives at the police training ground, a press officer tells him about operations the unit will demonstrate in today's drill. Aquí va a haber un secuestrado. Vamos a, a trabajar con sniper. Sí, va a ser a fuego real. The team are well tooled up and the dummy hostage is brought in to be rescued. Donald's a bit surprised they're allowing him to stay so close to the action. This exercise depends upon the accuracy of those snipers up there. They're going to take out the uh, watchmen over there and less than seven metres away. So I don't know whether they need to... Kidnappers dealt with, and the hostage safe, the simulated rescue is over. That's noisy. <laughs> One of the officers has agreed to answer some of Donald's questions. How do you protect your unit from infiltration from criminals? Nosotros vivimos la mayor parte del tiempo en el en el trabajo en el grupo, y nos vamos conociendo poco a poco, y nos da un margen de saber quién es quién y cuando vemos que alguien anda extraño hablamos con él y en su caso lo retiramos del jefe. The anti-kidnapping unit put on a good show of strength and solidarity, but Dono's not sure how much of it was a PR display for his benefit. It's not clear whether they are making any real difference on the streets. 
Donald's going to talk to some British expats who have been living here for a while. As foreign nationals, they are perceived as being wealthy. So Sarah, a news reporter, and Hannah, a publishing editor, both take precautions against kidnapping. I would never take a street taxi because to have three English people in a car, all obviously foreign, is just more of a risk than myself going, speaking to them in Spanish. Sarah and Hannah explain how unsuspecting foreign nationals are taken hostage after getting into fake taxis and then robbed at gunpoint. They call them express kidnappings, and they normally last an hour. Because they stop at a cash point and ask them to take out what they can and do it with the different cards that they've got and give them the PIN number so that they can do it so they can check that they're taking as much as possible. This girl that I know that was taken away, a foreigner like us, and she was beaten up, just dumped in this remote area. The next day, Donal is eager to find out more about express kidnappings and how they work. So he flags down the nearest cab, mindful that it could be driven by a potential kidnapper. How big a problem is kidnapping in your life and in the life of people you know? Sí, sí, he conocido gente que se dedica al secuestro muy fuerte. Están aquí hasta cinco vehículos nuevos. The taxi. So people actually buy taxis and conduct a business just for Kidnap Express. Al negocio de ese tipo de secuestro. Inclusive, en uno o dos meses han ganado hasta 350 mil pesos. Son impresionantes. Entonces, ahí está la clave de ellos. a random taxi driver knows people in his own neighbourhood running kidnapping operations, it shows just how widespread the problem is. Are they fearsome people? Are they scary? Are they violent? No, no, con miedo. Simplemente así que son conocidos de chicos y este... Pues nada más el saludo. Como mismo ya los conocen, es el saludo. Para el barrio es el saludo de nosotros. A los demás tal vez que sí. Sean la amenaza para los demás. From your experience, um, what percentage of, of kidnappings are ever reported to the police? Como uno, como un 98% más o menos que no se que no se denuncian, o sea, son muy pocos los que van a a denunciar ese tipo de personas. Por lo mismo, porque las mismas autoridades, este, están corridos con ellos. Todo por eso la gente se evita de ir a, a denunciar, porque la misma autoridad te dice. No vayas porque te conoce tu casa, te llega y te plomean y tú ya sabes, retira los cargos o, o tú le tiras, tú le sabes, ¿no? Ok, well, listen, thank you very much. It seems that here in Mexico City, no one is safe from the kidnapping scourge. Dono has found out that it's not only the wealthy that are targeted the poorer members of society are also at risk. Recent kidnaps have taken place with a ransom demand of as little as $200. Donald's heard about a recent case that shocked the city, the kidnapping of a five-year-old boy by a teenage neighbor. Javier Betanzos was kidnapped and killed in one of the most deprived areas of Mexico City. There seemed to be no motive for the kidnapping. A local woman has agreed to speak to Dono. Pues, la verdad, no, no les importa ya si eres rico o si eres pobre. 
pero aquí el secuestro de este niño fue que porque esta persona le dio mucho coraje que los papás del niño tenían un carrito y como ellos son comerciantes como nosotros, se compraron una camioneta. Entonces él pensó que yo creo que tenían más dinero y él y robó al niño para pedir. The boy's family spent days looking for him. Finally, a witness to the abduction came forward and both Javier and his teenage abductor were identified. Shockingly, the victim's relatives realized that his kidnapper was a 17-year-old friend of the family. How did the community feel about that kidnapping? Se sentía muy tenso el ambiente, eh? incluso a cualquier hora del día están secuestrando a los niños y no nada más a niños, a gente grande, sin importarles nada. Si uno tiene dinero, si no tiene dinero. Gabriela told Donald where he might find some of Javier's family, so he heads over there to see if they'll talk to him. When he arrives, the little boy's auntie is at home and willing to talk about his murder. How do you feel towards the person who murdered your nephew? Pues son personas que no merecen el perdón porque ni siquiera la muerte merecen, porque la muerte sería un un halago para ellos, porque ellos como quiera ya ya destruyeron una familia psicológicamente, moralmente. En todos los aspectos destruyen una familia. Y más que fue un niño chiquito que no merecía esa muerte. Se, se ensañó con ese niño porque le pusieron ácido correctivo, le inyectaron al niño. It turned out that Javier's teenage kidnapper had been acting on behalf of a ruthless kidnapping gang. In a bid to make a terrifying name for themselves, the kidnappers murdered Javier by injecting him in the heart with battery acid. Le inyectaron, usted se imagina, en vida, estar inyectando ácido correctivo y estarse quemando por dentro a los cinco años y con eso es injusto. En all his years as a crime reporter. This is one of the most harrowing stories Donal has ever heard. It's unbelievable that in this city, children are being killed by their own neighbours. Donal's already been told that one of the reasons why so few kidnappings get reported is because victims are afraid that the police may be corrupt. In a society where no one can be trusted, Donal wants to know about the options available to those who have members of their family kidnapped. Donal is on his way to meet a man who felt he had no choice but to take the law into his own hands. In July 2000, Paola Gallo was abducted and killed by kidnappers. Her father, Eduardo, a wealthy business consultant, has agreed to meet Dono and tell him the full story of his family's horrifying ordeal. Please, come inside. What kind of person was she? Well, she was a very, a very happy girl. She, she loved to, uh, to play jokes to anyone. Uh, she loved to make you laugh. Although Eduardo wasted no time in paying the $20,000 ransom, he never saw his daughter alive again. She was shot with a 45 caliber gun in the neck. At least she, she, she died uh, immediately. This, this was like, uh, I, would say, I was going to say like a cold water bath, but that would be nothing compared to what I felt. In the days after Paola's murder, the reasons why she was killed started to emerge. During the delivery of the ransom, the kidnappers themselves were robbed of half the money, and three of them were killed by unknown assailants. The remaining members of the gang killed Paola when they realized they didn't have the full ransom money. The police immediately assumed that Eduardo was behind the attack on the criminals. 
they said, okay, Mr. Gallo, uh, we're making an investigation. And in order to, to do our investigation, we would like you to explain us how those guys were dead. Maybe you have an idea. Well, I don't have an idea. And if you're meaning by having an idea that I killed them, you, you can all go fuck your mother. I was really, really angry. I, I lost my head. I started shouting them, yelling them, insulting them, and sending them where they should go. You lost your temper because you just lost your daughter. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to cement that I murdered the kidnappers, and because of that, they killed my daughter. And I said, well, you're, you're not only stupid, you're corrupt. In that moment is when I realized that they were not going to make an investigation. Knowing that a number of the gang were still on the loose, Eduardo began to track down his daughter's killers. I started collecting uh, information like photographs, like uh, uh, information about their families, their sons, their wives, their brothers, they fa their fathers, their cousins, where they lived, a lot of information. Uh, so I knew what I was, what I was looking, whom I was looking for, and uh, then I understood that they were four missing, and I said, okay, well, let's, let's find them. Through his own investigations, Eduardo was able to find three of his daughter's kidnappers. They were immediately arrested by the police. Then I continued looking for another one who was uh, the one who, who shot Paola. I found him in, uh, in the Estado de Mexico. I had only two bodyguards, so we did the, the job that was supposedly to be done by the authorities. We delivered this guy. Even though the kidnappers were all convicted, Eduardo still regularly checks to ensure that they haven't bribed their way out of prison. From time to time, I like to go to prison in order to be sure they're there. It has to be done in Mexico. Maybe in another country not, but in Mexico you have to be sure that things are kept the way they should. Check to make sure they're still in yes. jail because it's Mexico, you never yeah. know. Mm -hmm. What satisfaction does it give you that you actually managed to solve your daughter's crime? Well, it's not a matter of satisfaction. It's only a matter of, uh, of having justice. Uh, and also it's a way uh, of telling, even, uh, even she cannot hear me, but it's a way of saying, Paul, I love you. Dono McIntyre is in Mexico City. He's discovered that life is cheap and death is a celebrated part of the culture. <laughs> this is a city ravaged by crime and corruption, where kidnapping has become so common that the poor are abducting and murdering their own neighbours. Donald knows that his investigation won't be complete until he meets some kidnappers. He's come to the largest prison in Mexico where one has agreed to talk. Filiberto Vargas is now serving 60 years for allowing his home to be used by a gang to hold a victim hostage. 11,500 prisoners are in here, including Filiberto, the kidnapper part of a gang who kidnapped and raped a young woman. And he's here and he's going to tell us his side of the story. Donal is led out to a yard where Filiberto is waiting to meet him. What brought a pensioner like you to commit this crime? I didn't have a need, as it is said. No, but I wanted to buy my car, a taxi, para tener un poquito, supuestamente, más. How much ransom did you demand from the family of the victim? No, yo de eso soy ajeno a todo eso. Porque no, no más, yo no más era de darle de comer a la persona. Supuestamente me iban a dar 50 mil pesos. 
During the court case, the kidnapped victim revealed that she had been repeatedly raped during the time she was held hostage. When did you find out that she had been raped? Hasta que tuve yo detenido ahí, eh, o sea, en la delegación o la contaba con los judiciales cuando me lo nombraron ellos, porque me inculcaban a mí supuestamente la violación a la persona, el cual yo lo negué rotundamente y lo jamás he tenido contacto con la dama ni no. Is that is that true? Is it, you're in jail, you're serving 60 years. You can tell the truth now. Sí. Yo nomás la, el roce era con el, que la cuidaba. Yo contacto con ella no no tenía yo nomás hablaba con él. But you must have heard her her noise, her talking, her screams, her her crying. O a mí me sacaban. Me sacaban del domicilio o me mandaban a traer este, ¿cómo se llama? refrescos o antojos golosinas. Sí. Yo no, no para qué no nunca lo oía. You you're an intelligent man. You read the newspapers. Every day you hear the impact of kidnapping on people, the human tragedy on themselves. You must have known the woman in your house you were feeding was going through hell. Pues ya no puedo hacerme para atrás. No estoy. No, no, sí arrepentido de todo, ¿no? Porque pues eso es avaricia, ¿no? Y ya tenía lo que bien, la libertad y, mi, y un pequeño este, de dinero que tenía, ¿no? Y ahora, pues no. Tono's left wondering whether to believe Filiberto when he says he knew nothing about the rape. But it does seem clear he wasn't the leader. The reality is that Filiberto was just a small cog in a big machine. The leaders of the gang that he was involved with are still on the loose because they have the money and connections to pay off the authorities. Since Donal has been here, he's witnessed how the culture of corruption has spread throughout Mexico City. Kidnappings and other crimes often go unpunished. The rule of law in Mexico is weak, which sends out a message that crime pays. As long as Mexico remains a country where rich and powerful criminals can operate beyond the law, then organized crime will continue to hold a deadly grip over the capital, making Mexico City one of the world's toughest towns. <laughs>